Amen. Praise God, church. We'll get ready to uh, move forward here with the message here in just a few. Amen. Praise God. If you would find your seats and come on back. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. Well, welcome everybody. It's uh, truly a pleasure to, to be back in God's house here today and to give him praise, glory, and honor. I mean, God is so good to us. So good, so good, so good. Amen. Well, in the way of announcements, there's only a couple there. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on them, but if you look at your, uh, your handouts, there's a, a women's prayer meeting this coming Saturday at 10 o'clock, and the guys will actually will be here before that uh, for our men's breakfast at 8 o'clock because guys get up earlier than ladies, right? Well, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. I know my household. So anyway, um, and uh, so, so a couple of things there. And uh, uh, ladies, you've also got another activity that's on the schedule there for this coming Thursday night. Um, some, of the, some of the ladies said, you know, we want to do some of the stuff that normally the guys go and do. In this case, it's axe throwing. Now, guys, I'm not sure how you feel about your wife learning how to throw an axe if she doesn't already know. But... Uh, ladies, that's going to be happening this Thursday night if you would like to, to take part in that. Amen. If you are uh, here visiting with us today, we would like to uh, just thank you for being here, first of all. And then secondly, to uh, just kind of point out one of these what we call connect cards. There should be one somewhere around you. If you wouldn't mind filling that out either with a pen or the QR code on it, and we'd love to just kind of send you a follow-up email. We've got a small gift for you as you make your way out today. And uh, uh, just to thank you again for, for being here with us. Uh, <clears throat> if you um, would like to participate in, in our, our offering, uh, you can either do so online at the uh, springsjourney.com, the donate button, or there are boxes in the back. And God is so good to us. You know, we never want to try and manipulate people into giving, but man, when somebody is good to you, don't you want to be good to them? <laughs> And God has been so good to us, so we just want to honor him and honor him in accordance with what his word says and, and just out of the, the gratefulness of our hearts because he is so good to us. So with our tithes and offerings, we believe in that and we're able to do a lot of things in the community and so forth. Uh, just this past week, uh, we, we dropped off some little thank you gift bags to the teachers and the staff at Jackson Elementary just to say thank you guys that, that we're thinking about you. We appreciate you. And, uh, you know, so Tristan and others that helped her out with, with that, thank you so much for, for doing that as well. Amen. Um, well, I'm going to jump right into the, the word here today, I think. And uh, <clears throat> let's do this. Let's, I'm going to ask you to stand with me as we read this opening scripture. As we honor God's word by, by reading this, this first passage of scripture. And this is probably one of the most well-known passages of Scripture in the entire Bible. Guys, I hear a little bit of a thump, thump on my mic. Maybe bring me down just a little bit. Um, probably one of the most well-known passages of Scripture in Psalms 23. Psalms 23. And what I wanted to do, and I'm not doing this because Carol had us read lyrics a little bit earlier. I had already planned on doing this. And normally I just read it to you and have you follow along. But what I would like for us to do today is we're going to read this passage of Scripture together. Psalms chapter 23 verses 1 through 6. And we'll read off of the screen here in just a second so that we're all kind of reading the same translation and version and so forth. So um, in some of the churches that we used to attend in the past, they would do a lot of this responsive reading. And to kind of get everybody started off on the same beat, the person up front would always say, ready, read. So, so we'll do that, okay? Ready, read. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures, he leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Father, once more we just come to you and we thank you. We thank you for being so good to us. We thank you for being so loving to us. We thank you for being so forgiving to us, Lord. And God, as we come together today, I just pray that something that is said would, be, would quicken 
something inside of each one of us, Lord God, as you are able to do different things inside of us all at the same time because your word is alive and quick and powerful than any two-edged sword. So speak to us today, Father, and we'll respond to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Take your seats. <clears throat> the story is told of a, a guy in ancient days by the name of Ali Hafed. Ali was a Persian, a wealthy Persian, what we would today call Iranian. And he owned much land and many productive fields, orchards, gardens. And he had money loaned out to a lot of people at interest. Ali had a, lov a lovely family and at first was contented because he was wealthy. And he was wealthy because he was content. But an old priest came to Ali one day and told him that if he had a diamond the size of his thumb, he could purchase a dozen farms like the one he had. Ali said, will you tell me where I can find such diamonds? Well, the priest told him, if you find a river that runs over the white sands between high mountains, in those white sands you'll always find diamonds. Well, I will go, said Ali. So he sold his farm, collected his money, and he left his family in the charge of a neighbor, and he went away in search of diamonds traveling through many lands in Asia and Europe. And after many years of searching with his money all spent, he passed away in rags and wretchedness. Meanwhile, the man who purchased Ali Hafed's farm one day led his camel into the garden to drink. And as the animal put his nose into the shallow waters, the farmer noticed a curious flash of light in the white sands of the stream. Reaching in, he pulled out a black stone containing a strange flash of light. Not long after, the old priest came back to visit Ali's successor and found that in the black stone was a diamond. As they rushed out into the garden and stirred up the white sands with their fingers, they came up with many more beautiful diamonds, valuable gems. And according to the story, this marked the discovery of the diamond mines of Golconda, the most valuable diamond mines in the history of the ancient world. Had Ali remained at home and dug in his own cellar, or anywhere in his own fields, rather than traveling in strange lands where he eventually faced starvation and ruin, he would have had acres of diamonds. We feel only pity for Ali Hafed as we picture him wandering homeless and friendless farther and farther from the happiness he thought he would find in digging up diamonds in a far off place. Yet how many times do we look for our happiness at a distance in space or time rather than right now in our own homes with our own families and friends? The Savior of the world taught us to seek that inner peace which taps the innate happiness in our souls. He said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and don't be afraid. So many people are living in this state of constant dissatisfaction. And it'd be easy for us to think of people at work that are always in that mindset or people that we live next to, or people that we go to school with. But what about when we look in the mirror? Is that person also struggle with consistently being dissatisfied with life? Many people don't like their weight, don't like the job they have, they're unhappy in their marriage, unhappy with the financial status, unhappy with the way their hair looks, okay, whatever it might be, right? or you fill in the blank or whatever it might be, but it's just this constant state of dissatisfaction. And this is really what, for the last few weeks, I've kind of known I was going to share a message on this because it's just has been turning over and over in my, in my spirit and in my soul and my mind and my heart, however you want to say it, that too many of us as Christians, we're, we're living in this constant state of dissatisfaction. And what does God have to say about that? <coughs> well, I'll take you back to the psalm that we just read. And I'm not going to go back and read the whole thing, but I want to point out some of the highlights. Listen to what the author said. He said, I lack nothing. You make me lie down in green pastures. You lead me to the quiet waters. You refresh my soul. You guide me. I don't have to be afraid because you're with me. You give me comfort. You prepare a table for me before my enemies. You exalt me before my enemies. You anoint me with oil. You cause goodness and mercy to be my constant companions. Now, when we, th when we read this and we've heard it, uh, we always kind of pick up, or at least I do, on things like, and, and there's nothing wrong with this, but the peace that's mentioned, the protection that's mentioned, the, the comfort that's mentioned. But what I want to point out to you is I think there's an, there's an element or there's a concept, there's an idea that's woven in all of those scriptures that, that we don't really 
specifically point out, and that is simply satisfaction. Because when you read that 23rd Psalm and you read all of those things that I just mentioned, to me it's a perfect picture of someone who is in a, in a place of satisfaction. When, when you've got plenty to eat, when you've got plenty to drink, when you've got safety, when you're being exalted, when, you know, when you're being promoted, all these sorts of things, all of those tend to, to lead to a, to a sense of satisfaction. And I believe that's what God wants to do is he wants to bring us to a place of being satisfied. And I don't know how many of you here, as I'm talking, you may start to think about some areas of your life that you're really dissatisfied with. And it's not to say that, I was going to say this later, but just kind of going to right now. It's not to say that being dissatisfied with something is always bad because it pushes us forward. It pushes us to make changes. It pushes us to, to, to go further in God, if you will. But to be satisfied means that we're not, we're not yearning for something else. We're content with where we are or with what we have. For instance, when our hunger is satisfied, we don't want food. When our thirst is satisfied, we're not looking for anything else to drink. So when, when we're in that place of satisfaction, it causes us to be settled. And the, the message that I've given you today, and you've seen it already on your, on your handouts possibly or the, the weekly if you got it. But I titled today's message, The Elusiveness of Satisfaction. The Elusiveness of Satisfaction. And I really like this image that, that we came across for today for this because, you know, if you notice it, it's, it's kind of the unstated thing that stand out to me because the, the satisfaction was covered over, wasn't it? And it took, it took some peeling back of what was in front of it to get to the state of satisfaction. And I think in our lives, we need God to peel back the things that are preventing us from being satisfied in Christ. What is it that's in the way? Is it pride? Is, 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 it, is it wanting more of this or more of that? What is in there? What needs to be peeled back? What needs to be pulled away? This is the elusiveness of satisfaction. Elusiveness is defined as something that is difficult to find, catch, or achieve, or something that tends to evade grasp. Satisfaction is it difficult to find, is it difficult to achieve, to catch, or to grasp. It's elusive. And honestly, if we're going to be real with each other and real with ourselves, most of the time, when we do find ourselves in a, in a place of satisfaction, it tends to be short-lived. We, we only allow ourselves to, to stay there for, for a certain amount of time, and then we're, we're moving on to something else. We're, we're, we feel like we've got to push towards something else. There's a passage in Ecclesiastes I want to read. And I was, I was kind of laughing as I was reading through Ecclesiastes this week. If you're familiar with the book, um, there are some wonderful nuggets and wonderful principles and things that are revealed in that book. But, man, it can be a downer, too. <laughs> I'm just being honest with you. It, it can be a downer. There's some good stuff in it. But what I like even in that is you see the, the realness of the writer. You see the realness of the word. Because even those downer things that are in there, we find ourselves living in a lot of times. And so as we look at this, uh, for instance, in Ecclesiastes 4 and 8, it says, there was a man all alone. He had neither son nor brother. There was no end to his toil, yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. His eyes were not content. For whom am I toiling, he asked, and why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? This, too, is meaningless, a miserable business. This man was like, I'm working my tail off here. I'm working day in and day out. I'm constantly on the go. I'm constantly doing something for somebody else. I'm constantly putting myself, uh, you know, you know in, in the, the rear view so somebody else can be advanced. I'm constantly, constantly, constantly working. But for what purpose? Dissatisfaction. There's a website that I like to, to reference sometimes when I'm studying. I've mentioned it before. Some of you might be familiar with it. But it's simply called Got Questions. And I, I was, was reviewing... Uh, satisfaction and dissatisfaction on this particular website. And I just want to share something with you that, that I read there. It says, in some ways, the human heart is like a whining toddler. In some ways, the human heart is like a whining toddler. Now, I want to stop right there. I'm going to ask the guys in the back to get ready to play. I've got a 45-second like, clip that, that I want to show you, talking about toddlers and, and satisfaction or dissatisfaction 
So, guys, if we got that, let's go ahead and, and play that. You can have three sacks, but you can't have them right now, okay? You gotta wait. You gotta wait until mommy and daddy come back, okay? You can't eat these yet. You gotta wait until we come back. I'm gonna leave them right here. Don't touch them. Wait, okay? We're gonna come back. Don't wait. eat them yet. Don't eat them. We'll be right back. We just gotta go get them. Just, just wait a second. I just ran across that the other day, and I had saved it, and that little wiggle gets me. He does, you know. <laughs> but aren't we like that sometimes, you know, where we, uh, satisfaction, yes, but it's not, it's not, not long lived. Um, so I just wanted to share that real quick in relationship to the, to the scripture, but it says, again, going back to this article that I read, it says, in some ways, the human heart is like a whining toddler who, if left to himself, will never be satisfied. We tend to constantly demand more, bigger, better, flashier. Much of advertising today is designed to destroy our satisfaction and to make us think that we need, need more than we have. But when our hearts are filled with the Holy Spirit, the demands of our hearts can be brought under his control. We recognize that God has provided all we need for our present happiness, and we can therefore experience satisfaction. Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. So we find satisfaction in life when we uncover our true purpose in being here. As long as we pursue our own ideas of what will satisfy, we'll never quite find it. Now I wanted to do this little illustration, and I've asked for a little bit of help from a couple of folks in the audience. So uh, I think, Vanessa, you may be one of them, and Carol, or okay. All right. So... The reason I asked for help for this is because I don't want to be the only one that looks silly, okay? So I want some other people looking silly with me. So you ladies, stand up with you, if you will. Shake that up a little bit. And just begin to do what you do with these. That's all, really the only instruction I'm going to give right now. So. Come on, let's, let's get everybody involved in this. Come on, do it towards somebody. Let me come over here with Gary Marina. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna work the whole room you guys are pastor has lost his mind. You don't know don't know what's going on here. All right. Well what this was supposed to illustrate to you guys is that we can't blow bubbles. <laughs> <laughs> no, really, the, I, I, read, I ran across the, this illustration, and, and I liked it because what it talks about is when we're talking about the elusiveness of satisfaction, because normally, especially if we had kids, okay, you guys are adults and boring, but if we had kids in here and we started blowing bubbles, they would be snatching for it, and they would be jumping, and they'd probably be pushing each other over to get to them and all that sort of thing. And, and is, isn't that how we do life sometimes? We've got things out there, and we're grabbing for this, and we're grabbing for that, and it's just kind of like, you know, the next shiny thing that comes along gets our attention. And so uh, our, it's the elu elusiveness of satisfaction. And what happens if you do happen to catch one of those bubbles? It pops. It doesn't last long, right? And so all those things that we search after, all those things that we go after, that we push for, even if we get a hold of them, they don't seem to last. Have you ever wanted something really bad, and you worked for it, and you pushed for it, and you got it, and it really wasn't all that? How many times do we do that? And so, but we don't just do that once. We'll do it again. There will be a car that we want or a computer that we want or a phone or, or whatever it might be. And so we'll, you know, we'll push it, we'll push it, we'll push it, we'll get it. And then we get it, and we're like... Yeah, okay, after a couple of days, it's a phone. Yeah, you know, it's about all it is. But it's kind of like those, those uh, uh, long-time theologians, the Rolling Stones, said. <laughs> I can't get no satisfaction. <laughs> and isn't that how life is? We push and we scrape and we fight, but the things of this world don't satisfy 
They don't satisfy. They don't do it. There's no substance to these things. But it's always on to the next theme. I need more money. I need more authority. I need another promotion. I need another house. I need this. I need that. It's elusive. It's, it's, it's Ecclesiastes talks about it being like chasing the wind. And we just never quite grasp it. We never quite catch it. But I will say that on some level, I think a certain level of dissatisfaction can be a good thing. And what I mean by that is that, you know, I'm glad the medical field is never satisfied with the cures that we've come up with so far. We're always looking for something else. Technology is always moving forward. And in the same light, our walk with God is, is, is similar because I don't ever want to be so, I'm trying to be careful with the words here, complacent. And we might talk about that next week, about satisfaction versus complacency. There's a difference. And if we're not careful, we can get complacent in God, and that's not a good thing. But, but always wanting more of who he is, always wanting to know God better, that, that's a good thing. But the problem comes when we're so driven with chasing something else that we can't enjoy what God has done for us. When my eyes are so roaming and so set on trying to find the next thing, whatever that is, that I can't enjoy this thing. But I think we need to enjoy the journey. Enjoy the journey. Enjoy the trip. I think about the Israelites, and you might think there wasn't much to enjoy as they were going through the 40 years, you know, and, and they had their struggles. They had their, their rebellious moments and all that sort of thing. But even in that, God was teaching them that they could trust him. He was teaching them that he would provide. He was teaching them that he would help them to overcome enemies that, that they came in contact with. He was demonstrating who he was. He was revealing himself. So even in those moments, there were things to enjoy. And I think we need to learn to enjoy the journey that God's got us on. But as I said, you know, we're always looking for the next thing. And I wanted to be careful with this because I want to say also that there are times when there's no other choice but to be pushing forward. And what I mean by that is, is uh, I was thinking about when I was a kid, and I've shared this with some of you before, my parents were divorced, and my mom was raising three knucklehead boys all by herself. Okay, she's working two and three jobs, trying to keep the house together, trying to keep us straight, dealing with our school, you know, and all these other sorts of things. There was always something to be pushing toward next. And I get it. There are moments in our life, there are times in our life when we have no choice. It, it, sitting back and taking it easy and just being at peace or at, at rest is not always an issue are not always a possibility on the external. But I believe that even in those moments, God is able to bring a degree of peace into our hearts and into our spirits that allows me to know that I can trust him and that I'm safe in him. But I find it kind of crazy that the very thing that we are drawn to do, which to push is to, to push towards something more, is the same thing that wears us out. It's the same thing. I want to offer you two verses of Scripture, and you really see a contrast in them. Uh, the first one comes from Haggai, chapter 1, verse 5 and 6. And it says, Now this is what the Lord Almighty says, Give careful thought to your ways, for you have planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but you're not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. Now contrast that with this verse out of Ecclesiastes chapter 3. He says, I know that there is nothing better for people than to be happy and to do good while they live, that each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in their toil. This is the gift of God. Amen. To find satisfaction, this is the gift of God. And you can't really talk about satisfaction without at least uh, uh, talking, talking about or mentioning uh, what I call kissing cousins, which is, is rest and peace. Because you can't really be in a place of satis, uh, a satisfied place in your life if, you're in, if things are in turmoil or if you don't have peace. But God wants to grant all of that and bring all of those things together for us. And I came across something else that I want to give you six practical steps to finding satisfaction. I listed these on your hand out there for you as well. I'm not going to go real in depth with these. In fact, I don't think I'll be speaking very long today, honestly. But six practical steps to finding satisfaction. The first one is simply realizing that you can trust God. Realizing that you can trust God. 
even when we don't understand and even when things are going crazy, even when things are upside down and the world seems against us, we've got to realize that we can trust God. Not always going to understand everything that's happening. Not always going to like everything that's happening. Trust me, I've been there many, many times. But I'm learning that I can trust God even in those moments. Number two is making positive changes. What do I mean by that? Evaluating our life and saying, what things are in my life, what people are in my life that are promoting dissatisfaction? Because I can guarantee you, if you stop and evaluate things, you'll probably come up with, with one or two or 12 things or people that you constantly interact with, constantly allow into your life. Maybe it's a TV show you watch. Maybe it's music you listen to. Maybe it's people you hang out with. I don't know. But things or people that are in our lives that we're allowing to, to stir up a sense of dissatisfaction and prevent us from coming to that place of peace in the Lord, making positive changes. Focusing on the basics, number three, reading God's word, being in church, being active in church, praying and fellowshipping with God's people, basics. Being a blessing, there's joy in doing good for other people. I tell you, if you haven't blessed somebody intentionally, try it this week. I, try, I, I dare you, try it. Buy somebody's lunch, pay for their gas at the gas station. Just do, do something out of the ordinary. And the world calls it paying it forward. Okay, I can, I can live with that. Bless somebody and see what sense of satisfaction that brings into your spirit. The number five, I'll be honest with you, my wife is much better about this one than I am, but keeping a gratitude journal. Documenting the things that God has done for us. Document those things. And I, when, when you go back to those things, there are still times, you know, that she'll be cleaning uh, in the bedroom one day or whatever, and she'll come across something that, that she wrote like three years ago or something that God did for us like three years ago. And I say, man, I had kind of forgotten about this. And it just stirs up the sense of gratitude inside of us. And that gratitude then promotes a satisfaction and a spirit of peace over, us, over our lives. And the last one that I'm going to mention is differentiating happiness from joy. Understand there is a distinction between happiness and joy. Happiness tends to be circumstantial, circumstance-driven. Okay, if I, I walk out of here and, and, you know, the sun is shining bright and, and my car starts the way it's supposed to and somebody, you know, uh, drops off uh, lunch for us at the house or what, I don't know, I'm just making stuff up. But, but if things are, are, are going great, you know, and, and people at work are behaving and, and not being stupid, then, you know, that, 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 that tends to lead to happiness. But it's short-lived, isn't it? Because we live in a, a fallen world. But the joy that God gives, that joy that God will provide in your heart and in your spirit, it will get you through the times when you walk out and it's not shining, the sun's not shining, but it's raining. When the car doesn't start like it's supposed to, when the people at work are being crazy. It's that joy that will carry you through those moments. And see, there's a distinction between that circumstantial happiness and that God-given joy. Worship team, why don't you come on up? I told you I wasn't going to be long today. And I mentioned this earlier, that satisfaction does not imply that everything is perfect. So if you're here and, and you, you know, you, there, there's, there's a sense of, of uneasiness or unsettledness in your spirit and in your heart, it doesn't mean that, it doesn't mean that God can't step in and turn it around, but it also doesn't mean that, the, that he's not there with you developing that, that, that satisfaction. Because what I'm trying to say is that, well, let me just read a scripture to say it much better than I am at the moment. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 through 30. Jesus said it this way. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, you might say dissatisfied, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. <coughs> Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. <coughs> For I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest or satisfaction for your souls. For my yoke is easy <clears throat> and my burden is light. Yes. Come to me, all you who are weary, burdened, heavy laden, as King James says, dissatisfied. I'm going to ask you to stay with me as I read this last passage of Scripture and get ready to close things close things out here for today. 
from Psalms chapter 16. It says, keep me safe, my God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. I say of the holy people who are in the land, they are the noble ones in whom is all my delight. Those who run after other gods will suffer more and more. I will not pour out libations of blood to search gods or take up the names of my lips. But look at verse 5. Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen from me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night my heart instructs me. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at right, my right hand I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure. Because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. Nor will you let your faithful one see decay. You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Yes. Folks, this is the thing that God wants to do for us, that he wants to, to bring us into his presence, and he wants to, to bring that pleasure and to bring a, a sense of satisfaction in place of dissatisfaction and unsettledness. Worship team, you can go ahead and start playing or singing, whatever you got going there today. And I just want to really kind of close with this to say that while satisfaction is elusive, it is not unattainable. It's elusive, but it's not unattainable. It is within our grasp because of the God we serve. So I just want to pray here for just a second. I'm going to ask you if you bow your heads and, and just close your eyes for, for a minute. And if you would just be honest and say, yeah, you know what? I'm in this place of dissatisfaction. My soul is not at ease. I'm not at rest. I'm, I'm, I've got angst. I've, I'm, I'm anxious. It's just, just this unsettledness in me. And I just want you to pray for me, Pastor. If you will raise your hand and say, yeah, that's me. Mm. Wow. Jesus. i got hands front to back, left to right. Thank you. Pray for these people. Father, you see the hands of your sons and your daughters that are here right now. And God, we know that the pressures of life, they, they get to be a lot sometimes. They get to be a lot. Sometimes we feel like it's too much. But God, we just choose to lay this stuff down at the altar of God here this morning. And say, Father, I am yours. I realize that you are able to move in my situation. I realize you're able to move in my life. And I pray this over each one that raised their hand right now. God, touch your sons. Touch your daughters, I pray right now in the name of Jesus. Your word says that you will keep in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. And so, Father, we set our hearts, we set our minds on you, Lord God, to allow you the, the access into our hearts and the access into our lives, the access into our spirits and souls to make the changes that we need to have made. So as we are standing here in your presence right now, Father God, I say, let your spirit move. Let your spirit work. Touch each one, Father God, that said, Lord, I'm in that place and I need you right now. Bring peace in place of angst. Bring satisfaction in place of dissatisfaction. Yes, God. Yes, God. God, you can do it. You can do it. Let's worship with them. He is able. He's able to heal, he's able to save, he's 
able to deliver those who call on his name. He's able to conquer every foe. He is able, he is able. But I'm going to ask worship team if we can just do the, the last song that you guys did. Uh, I love you, Lord. I exalt you. And uh, I just want to say, uh, you know, I'm just going to going to remain right here. And if, if you want to have me just kind of touch and agree with you in prayer that God is going to move and God is going to work in your specific situation, then I just want to, you know, just open up this altar at this time as we've seen this last song in worship. I'll just hang out right up here and just, uh, please, I'd love to pray with you. Love to allow the Lord to put his, j just to minister to you specifically. It's one thing to generically raise our hands, and, and that's okay sometimes, but then sometimes we need just that extra focus and, and, and specific um, coming into agreement. So let's just worship with them, and Carol and I will be here to pray with you as well. <laughs> 